really Wednesday night represents uh, in that Holy Week, in that Passion Week, the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve, one of the beloved disciples of Christ. Walked with him, talked with him. Uh, and as we'll talk about again here in just a little bit, uh, they ate together, uh, you know, journeyed across the land uh, by foot and by boat together. And Judas was even given uh, the opportunity to be the, 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 the money holder. So there was some trust there, a significant amount of trust. Uh, and yet the guy that you put in trust of all the money is the same guy that betrays you for 30 pieces of silver uh, just a few hours uh, from now as we read. And so I, if the message, I don't even know. And I, I don't know. Did I, did I spell betrayal right? I hope so. If I didn't know, no big deal. Uh, but love and betrayal. Because tonight really to read it in a story and to talk about it. Uh, it almost is like uh, cinematic, like a soap opera. And so I thought it made me think of Days of Your Lives or uh, whatever many of those might be. Uh, because it really just doesn't even seem uh, logical that somebody that would walk with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on a daily basis would get to the point that he would betray him and not only betray him for 30 pieces of silver but even to the point in the Garden of Gethsemane when the centurion guards would come the disciples were exhausted for whatever reason whether they were grieving uh, because I, I, you guys have heard me say that before grief will absolutely wear you out you know, I watch people at funerals all the time that stand on their feet for a whole day and then have to lay a loved one to rest the next day. And they've absolutely lost the ability to cry anymore. It's just not there. They've cried so much and wept so much. There's nothing there. And you can see the exhaustion on their face because they're being respectful to everybody that comes through. Thank you. Appreciate you coming by. Oh, I didn't know you knew him, or I didn't know you knew her. Oh, well, I'm so thankful you came by. Well, it's nice to meet you. They shake a lot of hands and meet a lot of people uh, at a lot of funerals, and it becomes absolutely exhausting. And so I wonder to myself sometimes if that's why the disciples couldn't stay awake, because remember Jesus said, well, can you not stay with me one hour? Just stay awake and be aware of what's going on for an hour. Nonetheless, Jesus turned around and found them asleep. <clears throat> and even upon waking them up, uh, they would drift back off into that place. And I wonder if it's because they didn't understand everything that was going on. It was a very an emotional time. Jesus is on his face in the garden of Gethsemane, crying his eyes out. So much, the Bible says, that it became as great drops of blood that ran from his face. Now we can go back and we can look scientifically at those kinds of things. And there's a lot of people that have taken uh, that kind of aspect and that kind of look at it and said, well, and I've done it myself. I prayed before at an altar and ruptured the blood vessels in my eye because my blood pressure was high and all the blood rushes to your head and it'll pop these little veins and it'll look like somebody punched you in the eye. You'll have those little black spots uh, on the inside of your eye there. And so I wonder if that's what it was like if Jesus... Literally, it spent so much time, his blood pressure was uh, elevated to the point that began to burst those blood vessels in his eyes. And maybe he did even rupture them to the point that as he wept, it dripped out of his eyes like drops of blood. We don't get a lot of details in those kinds of things. We really don't get a lot of details uh, overall. In this story that we're about to read out of the Gospel of John. Love and betrayal. Love and betrayal. The Word of God says no greater love hath any man this that he lay down his life for his friends. We have been taught and instructed over the course of our Christian walk in our lifetime. That God is love. That his love for us was so great. That he allowed Jesus, his only begotten son, to die on the cross for the sins of the world. For all the wrongs that you and I ever committed. So we see the love. 
But tonight I wanted to talk with you uh, a little bit, not only uh, about the love, but about the betrayal as well, and how the betrayal ultimately can lead back to that love uh, personified. So tonight when we look at these passages of scripture, it, it's a paradox of Judas betrayal and Jesus' command to love one another all in the same evening. This all happens at one time, one night. And I think the thing that we speculate a lot of times on is, you know, we're never really told uh, why Jesus betrayed Christ. People speculate, but I mean, 30 pieces of silver really wasn't, it wasn't like that was uh, a million dollars worth of wages that Judas was going to become overly wealthy off of. It's really nothing uh, in comparison to the life of Christ. To the guy that you had walked with and you had watched cleanse lepers and heal blinded eyes. Judas was on the boat when Peter walked on water. He had seen these miraculous things that had transpired and taken place. And so for 30 cheap pieces of silver Judas sold out Jesus. But can I tell you that we live in a world today, uh, and it's funny, Brian, as we talk up here, now that I think about it, it is hard sometimes because I watch people sell Jesus out for so much less than 30 pieces of silver. Oh, yeah. For a little quarter gram of meth or heroin, that's all it takes to plunge you right out of the uttermost and back into the guttermost of life that God delivered you out of. One choice, one decision, one night. You go all the way. And so it does become discouraging sometimes as a minister. But I think that as I find myself sometimes being discouraged in that area, watching people fall away, uh, you know, you see people, they come to church, as they say, religiously uh, for a while, and then something's said or something's done that upsets them, and they can easily walk out the door and never come back after building, the, we have a relationship, a friendship, we've ate lunch together, we've talked together, we've prayed for one another's families, and so I guess for me, it's just hard to release people that easily. But we live in a society today where that's become ever more easy than it's ever been. The, I mean, think about it in terms of a marital relationship. Average marital relationship in the United States of America today doesn't last uh, two and a half years on average. So that's what a lot of people get into. They, they want to... Uh, they want to shop around for the car before they buy it. They want to test drive everything. That's part of the problem we have in the society that we live in today is that we don't have people that are wholly committed. You can't even hardly have a board in a church anymore because inevitably if you put a board together, somebody's going to get their feelings ruffled and, poof, and then the backbiting will start and the tail bearing will start and the next thing you know it will divide a church right down the middle. I'd much rather just be a part of a pastor-driven church, a, a congregational-driven church where everybody just kind of has a say-so and what goes on and we just go with it. Don't have hierarchies and cliques and power-tripped people uh, because it always leads to failure. I've seen it so many times. And yet Jesus had 12 disciples. And uh, as we're about to read in the Word of God here that in verse 21 of the 13th chapter. And again, getting back into talking about Judas just real quickly. We, we, we're never really given a definitive answer as to why Judas really betrayed Jesus. I mean, was he mad at him about something? Was it honestly for 30 pieces of silver? Not only to betray him, but to betray him in that garden with a kiss. When no one else could stay awake, and if they would have, they may have seen the torches as they were coming to take Christ away. Maybe they would have been a little 
better prepared for what was about to transpire and take place? I don't know. I don't know. Because you see, all this happened at night. It's a very, very dark night. I think about that and I think about so much that happens in the darkness in the world that we live in still today. You know, most people who uh, stumble and fall back into alcoholism don't do it in the broad daylight. They just don't. Most people who fall victim to drug addiction and the perils that are created with it, it generally doesn't happen in the daylight. It generally starts out in the darkness somewhere, tucked away in a bedroom in private with paranoia hiding, looking through the blinds, hoping we don't get caught, hoping no one knows, until inevitably it finally <laughs> blows up in our face and it becomes public. Yep. Remember I've told you guys that old, when I was a kid there was an old rap song that said, the freaks come out at night. The freaks come out at night. And there's so much truth to that. I mean, you could go to Walmart in the daytime. There's a little bit of normalcy there. Go after midnight and check that freak show out. Yeah. You never know what you're going to see. It's crazy because the darker it gets, the less ambition people have uh, to hide anything. And so they feel like they can get by with more because the darkness is a shroud or a cloud that covers what they're doing, the way they're living, the way they're dressed, the things that they're doing. I don't know, maybe he was just trying to make a fast buck. Could have been. But the Word of God says this in John, the 13th chapter, verse 21. When Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, Barely, barely, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. That's written in red in my Bible. So Jesus is literally prophesying his own betrayal uh, that's about to come about. So one thing that we know for certain is that Jesus, being God in the flesh and making this statement, he knew what was going to happen. And I'm pretty certain... Uh, because of the same reading that he knew who it was who was going to betray him. Because the same night, uh, he would tell Peter what he was going to do. He would look at the disciples. But he would do something that is so uncharacteristic of the world that we live in today. That in the midst of the darkness of night and the betrayal of those who said they loved him. Because inevitably, if you remember, you read this story. When the centurion guards, after Peter had lopped off an ear of one of them, and Jesus had healed him, and Judas had kissed him, they marched Jesus away and said, All of the disciples fled. None of them followed, they all fled. They all ran a different direction into the darkness. Whether it was out of fear, anger, ill preparedness. I don't know a lot of the, the, the situations, but we do know that the Word of God says that none of them followed Him. They all ran away. And so verse 22 says, Then the disciples looked on, uh, or, or looked one on another, doubting of whom He spake. You know the way it goes? I mean, if I were to say something that was just a touch on somebody who's sitting next to you, and I wouldn't even know anything about it, but you would, and you'd be wondering, how did he know that? That's why people get mad at ministers all the time, uh, because a lot of times he'll just preach whatever the Lord lays on his heart, and it gets a little close to whoever in the congregation, and they feel like he's got an inside line, uh, and it's communicating with someone about the way they're living. No, it's just Holy Spirit led more often than not. I sat in church with a, an old guy by the name of Bicel Brand. I loved him so dearly. Jamie Ragel has been one of my favorite comedic evangelists for years and years and years. And I remember Jamie Ragel, he was preaching. He's in the midst of just, he's got people laughing. He's got people crying. And old Bicel, he was old enough. He'd heard it all, seen it all. He'd been in hundreds of church services. But he always said over kind of where all I and my youth group did. 
And I saw him reach into his pocket and out slid this shiny pair of nail clippers. And old Bicel began to trim those fingernails. And I mean, Jamie Rabel's preaching like I preach. He's up there, he's having a good time. And all of a sudden, mid sins not even looking Bicel's way, he stopped and said, there is somebody who is trimming their fingernails right now. And I watched Bicel go, all 90 years of him, and wisdom, he gently slid those nail clippers back in his pocket and put his fingers together like that. <laughs> Nobody had to tell him that Bicel was trimming his fingernails. And I don't think that he heard it. I think that he was really just being in tune with the Spirit of God. And God would just lay things on him at times. It was just amazing uh, to watch him and to hear him preach in that, that aspect. And, that kind of fervor and that zeal and then just to call things out that were going on because he wasn't from around here he didn't know anybody this is back before you could get on facebook and find out everybody's dirt he could walk into the church be talking about somebody who was caught up in a uh, in, in an adulterous affair and i'd watch him as he'd lay his hand on their shoulder as he was walking by wow because i knew what was going on Jamie didn't have no idea. The Spirit of God just took conviction and went as he passed by. It's amazing stuff. So anyway, let me get back into the word here and get us back on track in this love and betrayal because I want us to understand that in this very dark time, this most evil time, this night time, when all this is transpiring and all this is taking place, the one thing that we are going to find in the Word of God as we read through it tonight, Brian, this may be the one thing that I look back on, is that when I feel like I've been betrayed or let down, I've always been reminded that Jesus loved. He loved. And so it goes on in verse 22 and it says, Then the disciples looked one with another, doubting of whom he spake. Because everybody wants to know, right? They want to get in on the gospel. Verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Verse 24 says, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. Man, they're nosy. They really want to know. And it makes me wonder where their hearts are really at. If they really want to know, because to me, that's the way I act when I get caught. Well, who are you talking about? Well, what happened? What went on? Well, tell me a little bit about it. Am I busted? <laughs> Is it I that he's talking about? Verse 25 says, He then lying on Jesus' breath saith unto him, Lord, who is it? You ever get to that point? Well, you just want to know, how do I don't play the guessing game anymore? Well, they sit in this pew. Well, they don't come all the time, but they come periodically. Well, she's got, she's, well, she's changed her hair color. Let's just say that. Or, you know how people do, they try to lead you in and lead you on with these clues. To the point you finally say, no, I'm an idiot. I don't know. Who is it? Just tell me. Tell me who it is. I don't know. Because now you've got me in this soap opera, this love and betrayal. Who shot JR? I don't want to wait all summer. I want to know right now. <laughs> right? Yeah. Longest summer of my life as a child. Everybody, their who shot JR shirts and hats. Everybody want to know who shot JR. And then just like in most soap operas, isn't it always the person that you least expect? But there's always that one person that said, I knew it. Told you. But you didn't tell me. Oh, but I knew it. Oh, did you? Well, what led you and prompted you to believe that? You know, and that's when I get inquisitive. That's when my detective comes out. I'm like, oh, okay, Sherlock. Well, tell me what led you to uh, the assumption that you knew who was going to shoot Jr. a year ago because nobody else in the country did. 
Well, listen to this in verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. But God, you're going to do that for all of us. There's 12 of us sitting at this table. You're going to break bread with every one of us this afternoon. <laughs> but then, when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now listen to this in verse 27. Now remember that. Hold on to that. Because Jesus has done something uh, amazing. We celebrated communion last week. The last supper that Jesus would have with his disciples. Now think about this. Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, the very man that would betray Christ with a kiss. Jesus broke bread with him. Jesus drank with him and ate with him. And guess what? Jesus knew who was going to betray him. And yet it didn't stop his love. It didn't stop his love. He didn't say, Judas, you get up and leave this table right now. You betrayer. Nope. His love was so great that what he did with the rest of the disciples, he did with Judas as well. Because that is love personified. Yeah. When there is no hypocrisy in our love, that is the love of God shining through to us. Unfortunately, we all have the ability to have hypocrisy in our love. And that's why we need the love of Christ Jesus in us and living through us. It's never been more prevalent to me than it has been this last year, 2021. COVID madness, political madness. People arguing, fighting, losing just absolute control of everything over things in the long run and the reality of eternity really. They don't matter a whole lot anyway. God's word, be thine truth. It's going to play itself out. It's going to happen. Just like in the garden, if they would have stayed awake and saw the torches coming, guess what? It had been prophesied. Jesus was still going to get betrayed that night. He was still going to get carted off by the centurions that night. He was going to be taken before Herod Agrippa Cisaphius, he was going to be persecuted. And then he was going to go on to the cross yeah. and die for the sins of the world. Yeah. Nothing you or I could have done to change that from happening. Verse 27. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, thou, that thou doest, do quickly. I still love the fact that every time I read that verse, that I am reminded that Jesus is still always in control of even the lost. He's the one that can pull and tug at their heart when they are ready. He's the one that can drive a man to his face in repentance. When his spirit begins to beckon and pull and tug at their heart. Verse 28 says, Now no man at the table knew for what the intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought because Jesus had, Judas had the bag, that Judas had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Verse 30 goes on and says, He then, having received the sop, went immediately out in these powerful words. This is why I like the King James Version of the Bible, because even when it's not poetic, it is poignant. And it was night. It was dark. 
It's a dark time. It's a dark time not just in the life of Christ, but in the life of the disciples. It was a very dark time that was about to come on the church. Verse 31 says, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. <coughs> Verse 33 is so beautiful. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, well, folks, this is where we got to get it right. Don't take in any of the other teachings. Or at least we have a hard time taking in the teachings of Christ. All in red letters in verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you. But you also love one another. You ever stress anything to your kids and you repeat it? Just to say, don't make me repeat myself. And yet Jesus, in these words, he says that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. It must have been important. For Christ to let the disciples know that, hey, you got some perilous times coming ahead of you. It's going to be some rough patches in the road. But the one thing I came and lived on this earth that I'm going to die on the cross for is that you guys can love one another. And in showing love to one another, you will become my church. And in the love people will see in you, they'll see the love in me. And the love in me that they see in you will turn this whole world upside down for the love of Christ. Verse 35 says, By this shall man know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. So one aspect that we, we keep screwing up in the church and in the world that we live in today. We do good for a while, and then we blow it. We do good for a while, and then we blow it. I want to read you this story real quick, because love is what God's trying to impart and place on us in this very dark and most evil time that we live in even now. And so, there's a story about a liberal prime minister, William Gladstone. And in announcing the death of Princess Alice on the 14th of December, 1878, the House of Commons told this touching story. The little daughter of the princess was seriously ill with diphtheria. And so the doctors told the princess not to kiss her because by kissing her, she would endanger her own life by breathing in the child's breath. Once when the child was struggling to breathe, the mother, forgetting herself entirely, took the little one into her arms to keep her from choking to death. And rasping and struggling for her life, the child said, Mama, kiss me. <laughs> Without thinking. No thought, no plan put into it. Princess Alice tenderly kissed her daughter. And as a result, she contracted diphtheria. And she died just a few short days later herself. You see, real love forgets self. Real love puts me on the back burner. Real love knows no danger. Two. Real love doesn't count the cost, as the Word of God says. Song of Solomon in the eighth verse, or in the eighth chapter, verse seven, says, "Many waters cannot quench love, 
Neither can the floods drown them. And you know, on the same night, this is amazing to me, of his betrayal. Christ's example of love was so great that he showed us that it wasn't a dog-eat-dog -dog kingdom that he was trying to build. It was a kingdom of love. And so you know what he did? He took it upon himself to take on the lowliest of actions that night. He began to wash the feet of his disciples. You know the point Peter said, no, 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 no. I must wash your feet. You can't wash mine. And Jesus had to quiet Peter in his loud mouth again and say, Peter, don't get it. I came as a servant to love many. On Good Friday in A.D. of 29, Paul would deliver these words, summing it up in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how I keep on forgiving. That's how I keep on loving. So I keep on working on myself as I keep on reminding myself that God loved me so much that he went to the cross and died for my sins. How could I ever be upset about that? We look on the passage of scripture that says love your neighbor as yourself and we look at that uh, a lot of times as if that was a, a a New Testament commandment that we were given, but really it comes out of the Levitical laws in the Old Testament. The exact words, as a matter of fact. But rather than follow the Torah and the law of the Old Testament, when Christ spoke it and said to love thy neighbor as thyself, it was the law of the New Covenant. The New Covenant that you and I, if we weren't engrafted as Jews, we couldn't even be here today. But the Bible says that when Christ was crucified and he had shed his blood that the temple veil that the high priest had to be sanctified, cleansed, washed and without sin. The high priest would wear a garment that had bells attached to the bottom of it. And they would move constantly as they were in the basin washing their hands and as they were sacrificing turtle doves and as they were making their way back to where that big huge temple veil was at because behind that veil was a box called the holy of holies it was there that the priest could go in if he was holy and without sin and only if he was holy and without sin and he could pray for the people They had bells on their garment. And that priest, they would even tie a rope around his ankle. Because if he walked in between that veil and he had sin in his life, those bells, jingle bells, jingle bells, would quit jingling. And they would know to pull that priest out. Because he had died, because he had touched the Ark of the Covenant with sin in his heart, in his life. <laughs> I'm glad I got Jesus. I'm glad I got Jesus. Yeah. Who when he shed his blood, it said the temple veil was rent in twain. Yeah. <clears throat> and for the first time, you and I, Gentiles, could gain access to the Holy of Holies because the Spirit of God would be dispensed to everybody. All in a moment, in a blink of an eye. That's why they call it the Gentile dispensation of grace. Because we would not have received any grace if it had not been for it. Yeah. God's love was so great, Jesus' love was so great, that he loved me long before I ever knew him. 
He died on the cross for my sins. And so the example of love that he gave in the washing of feet is the final apologetic. Because that's what we're called to do. We're called to love. Francis of a side put it wonderfully like this. He said, preach the gospel at all times. And when it's necessary, use words too. That's a pretty profound statement. Preach the gospel at all times. And when it's necessary, use words too. Because the life we live is the message that we preach. And if we are not preaching love, we are not preaching the gospel. So let us resolve this holy week to commit to grow in love for one another. Not thinking of ourselves more highly than our brother or our sister. Amen. Because I believe that just the few that are seated here tonight, through your invite, through your love, through the phone call you'll make, we can pile people side by side in here Sunday morning. We can fill this place. Use the nursery we have to for an overflow. Pack them in everywhere. Bring in the lost. We'll set up more chairs. So that we might tell people that they too can be saved and know Christ Jesus as Lord. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, Mike. I'm done. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you continue to minister to our hearts and our lives and take us from this place, Lord, that we might remember this holy Wednesday. That we might remember that in all reality, the word tells us that Judas ran to the priest that he had sold you out to and out of guilt or shame or whatever it was he threw those 30 pieces of silver at their feet and the Bible tells us that he went out and hanged himself Father I want more than that for the people that we know and we love so I pray that they all may make the alternative choice that Judas could have made that night. And that would have been to run all the way to the cross of Calvary. And not only throw the silver, but throw himself at the feet of a Savior. And say, Father, forgive me. God, we've all betrayed you. For that we're sorry. I pray that you'll forgive us of our wrongs and our trespasses. And I pray that you'll help us to go forward this week loving people and encouraging people not to just come to church on Easter Sunday, but to know your Son, Christ Jesus, as Lord and Savior, that they too might experience this love that we get to experience in spite of ourselves. For that, love you tonight Lord thank you thank you for all that you do for us daily please help us not to forget it remind us in our thoughts and in our hearts and help us to share the love that you have so graciously shared with us I pray and ask it tonight and every night in Jesus name Amen